let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Chris uh, in, in a way, this session is a showcase for the, uh, for the home talent, because both Chris and Harold James are, are here, and Ricardo was a very recent uh, uh, colleague of ours, too. Chris. Okay, this, um, this talk is based um, this talk is based on a, a paper I wrote for the Bank of France uh, Financial Stability Review, uh, which they embargo until Saturday. Presented at a panel meeting at the IMF. Uh, but after that, it should be on my webpage and the Bank of France. So this is about the uh, Euro area and what seemed to me to be the gaps in its institutional structure. It looks to me as if at the time of the founding of the EMU, at least most of the participants, or most of the influential participants, had a munderous view of inflation control and central banking. They believed that a determined central bank can always control inflation by controlling money growth. Fiscal and monetary interactions exist in principle, and they consist of attempts by the fiscal authorities to get the central bank to buy more government debt than is consistent with stable, and infl stable inflation, and that this is inherently bad. Um, and therefore, that an, institu an institutional design with a single large central bank and a fractured fiscal authority and many smaller treasuries and legislature is therefore less likely to be subject to inflationary pressure from the fiscal side than is usual, than in the usual single country fiscal and monetary institutional affairs. But this view of central banking and inflation missed some important aspects of central banking and inflation. One is that it's essential that monetary policy actions have fiscal backing. I'll make, go into some more detail about that um, on a later slide. Every monetary policy action requires a corresponding fiscal action, and um, this is, um, ha has been treated, is usually treated as largely implicit, but it can become very important. Second, inflation, surprise inflation and deflation uh, are a fiscal cushion. Uh, and this cushion is given up by individual countries that join the EMU. And finally, the importance of a lender of last resort and the fact that a lender of last resort backed by fiat debt, by, by a government that can issue fiat debt in its own currency, um, is uh, the most effective form of a lender of last resort. So I'll go through these aspects um, in a little more detail. Um, in a group of papers, uh, a line of research that's been called the fiscal theory of the price level, it's really a little bit of a misnomer. It's really just pointing out that in standard macro models that they, that, as they existed um, before this literature, for the most part, um, fiscal policy was left implicit. The model was written without any formal treatment of the government budget constraint. Uh, no formal specification of fiscal policy, and the termination of the price level was studied entirely using money supply and demand. Um, but this literature pointed out that that kind of model, uh, by ignoring fiscal monetary interaction, could reach mi misleading conclusions about how inflation is determined. <clears throat> now, these papers didn't explicitly model <laughs> currency unions, but from their perspective, um, since they did involve looking at the symmetric role of fiscal and monetary institutions in determining the price level, it was clear at the start that the euro would be unstable. I wrote a paper called The, fiscal, the Precarious Fiscal Foundations of EMU in The Economist in 1999, uh, which basically said that something like what's happening now was bound to happen. Um, so the implication of of this way of looking at uh, inflation control and price determination uh, is that a central bank can, that's quote, independent, can determine the prices, the time path of prices uh, 
only if every policy action, monetary policy action it takes engenders a validating response from the fiscal authorities. These responses don't have to be immediate, but people have to be confident in them. So let me give you some, uh, or no, in other words, there's no automatic mechanism by which fiscal discipline can be compelled by a central bank that controls money growth. Here are a couple of examples of the implications of this way of looking at things. When a, when a central bank increases the interest rate, it causes, of course, an increase in the interest expense component of the government budget. If, when the central bank raises the nominal interest rate, the result is simply to pass that interest rate increase through the government budget into an increased rate of issue of nominal government debt, there is no contractionary effect of the interest rate rise. The interest rate rise can have a contractionary effect only if it's validated by a current or expected future action on the part of the fiscal authorities to counteract the implied increase in rate of issue of nominal debt with an increase in taxation or a decrease in expenditures, an increase in the primary uh, surplus. And there are examples of countries and periods where this dynamic is at the center of monetary policy thinking. In a high inflation Latin American country where interest rates are 20 or 25 percent and inflation rates are the same or a little higher, it's, off, it's likely to be true that interest expense is a major fraction of the government budget. It's likely to be true that there's political um, paralysis that prevents there being effective actions taken to reduce expenditure or increase in, uh, taxation when the interest rate increases. So the central bank thinking about, well, interest rate is 20% now, the inflation rate looks like it's 30%. We know that to control inflation by conventional theory, we should push that interest rate above 30%. But they look at what will happen in the legislature if they do that they see that there will be no action on the part of the legislature to prevent the flow through of that interest rate increase to an increase in the rate of issue of nominal debt, and it makes them hesitate. And it's likely to make them actually not act because they realize that the, the rise in the interest rate would not have a contractionary effect if it has no fiscal back. <coughs> Another implication is that the central bank balance sheet matters to its ability to control inflation unless everyone is sure that recapitalization from the fiscal authorities is available when necessary. In order to hold inflation down, a central bank has to be able to contract, meaning in conventional monetary policy terms, undertake open market operations. Contractionary open market operations involve selling assets. If you don't have as many assets as you have liabilities, you can run out. If people see that that's a possibility, they may not be, not, uh, your, your attempts to contract by selling assets may not have the desired effect. In fact, they can create, they can make matters worse. If everybody is sure that if you need to contract, you, uh, you'll be able to do it by issuing, by, uh, by selling assets, and if you run out of them, the treasury will simply print you up some more treasury debt and hand it over and you can sell that then you're, there's no problem with, the, with being in a negative net worth situation. But people have to be confident that that kind of backing would emerge if you're gonna be able to control inflation and you have a and you, you have negative net worth in the central bank. In the EMU, um, <coughs> the, if we ask ourselves how do these interactions work out in the EMU, <coughs> you can see that um, well, if in, in a single country, a legislature uh, that is continually expanding nominal debt in an exponential way uh, and sees inflation uh, emerging may at least eventually recognize that steady expansion of nominal government debt will be inflationary. <clears throat> um, in, for a country that's a small part of a currency union, however, the connection is much attenuated. If you're uh, issuing debt for the U.S. or Brazil, 
it may become clear that the rate at which you are issuing nominal debt is impacting inflation in your country. If you are Portugal or, or Greece, the notion that the rate at which you're interest, issuing nominal debt is affecting the rate of inflation in the euro area is much more remote. <clears throat> and uh, so when a, when a legislator who is skeptical of economists asks himself, what actually is the problem with issuing more and more government debt and not taxing to back it up? The only real problem with that is that it can result in inflation. There isn't really any con to a legislature that can continue to do that why should they worry about issuing more nominal debt? There's no inflation, taxes aren't increasing, and they're able to finance expenditures by issuing, by issuing debt. If it's nominal debt in, a, in the euro, it's, uh, and, there's, uh, and you're not going to default, uh, there's, a, there's no problem with issuing the debt. Uh, this feedback from, in, from debt issue to inflation is gone in a, in a monetary union. In a currency union, the fiscal response to monetary policy that's required has to be present in all members of the union. So all it takes is one or two where you're not getting the response that's required to create a problem with fiscal backing for monetary policy. And recapitalization by bond issuance requires some kind of agreement amongst all members of the, un of the currency union about who's to bear the fiscal burden of issuing the debt that uh, is used for the recapitalization. So all these elements suggest that fiscal backing is much more questionable in the European Monetary Union than in a single country like uh, England or U the US. So some people have regarded as paradoxical that that the, uh, the British and the Americans are not paying big premium on their, on their government debt, even though if you look at, their, at the fundamentals, the ratio of debt to GDP, the ratio of uh, the deficit, deficit to GDP, they look as bad as many of the members of the, of the uh, EMU who are subject to a big default premium. <coughs> it's not a paradox. The, the, different, the, uh, the reason it's not a paradox is that the US and the UK have their own currency and that this fiscal backing is not uh, an issue. Um, inflation is a cushion. Uh, unexpected inflation and deflations occur regularly in advanced economies. Um, I've done, in an old paper, I actually calculated how much uh, unexpected capital loss and gains there are for holders of U.S. government, have been historically for holders of U.S. government debt over time. These <laughs> unexpected capital gains and losses are rather substantial relative to the size of the whole government debt. They tend to roughly coincide, the, lo the capital losses to holders of debt tend to roughly coincide with periods of great fiscal and economic stress in the U.S. And then in recoveries, they get capital gains that offset them. Um, this is an important stabilizer that's not available once you sign on to the, you sign your country on to the EMU. Um, it's all, they're not, also not available to U.S. states, but it's a familiar point that the U.S. states are, do have available fiscal cushions in the form of, of implicit and explicit transfers between states that soften the blow of economic, of negative economic uh, shocks in an individual state in the U.S. Uh, and these, these kinds of fiscal flows are much smaller in the EMU. Finally, fiat currency liquidity and lender of last resort. Nominal government bonds need never default. They only promise to deliver paper. And if the government is issuing its own currency, it can always produce the paper at, at zero cost. Um, unanticipated inflation or deflation produces unpleasant or pleasant surprises in the return to holders of nominal debt. But this is quite different from default. Take a country in a given situation in terms of its deficits and expected future deficits and surpluses. <coughs> 
and have one able to issue its own currency so that the uncertainties will be reflected in inflationary and deflationary losses or gains to the, the holders of government debt, and the other unable to issue its own currency so the uncertainties are reflected in probabilities of outright default. With outright default, the holder of the government debt doesn't know when or how the losses will, be, will occur. Losses to holders of debt can occur via one particular issue of debt that has to be rolled over at a particular date, uh, not rolling over. It can occur via an across-the-board revaluation of debt. Uh, it can occur through partial repudiation uh, with different levels of repudiation possible. The uncertainties to the holder of a government debt, since there's nothing in the contract he's holding that tells him what kind of default is going to occur, are much greater than the uncertainties to holder of government, holders of government debt who are worried about inflation. The inflation will occur uniformly across holders of government debt, and it's easier to understand what will determine the inflation. Uh, a lender of last resort is, is very important in some circumstances. Extreme shocks like what we've recently seen in which many private debt contracts become subject to con contagious worries of default risk. An institution that's not itself subject to such worries can intermediate to provide liquidity in such a situation. Sometimes, historically, uh, private, uh, very large private financial institutions or groups of them have provided such, a, uh, such liquidity, but the most effective uh, lender of last resort is one that's least subject to doubt about its own ability to deliver on credit contracts. So a central bank that can lend, that, that has fiscal backing and can lend in a currency, in a fiat currency that's issued by its fiscal backer is the most effective uh, lender of last resort. So from this perspective, how, what's the situation in the EMU? seems to me there are broadly two directions to move. One is to make everyone realize that they've signed on to, a loss, to the loss of the inflation cushion, the loss of an effective lender of last resort, and the need for occasional national bankruptcy with EMU receivership. Um, this is what, the, uh, my view is that this is, an, is not a stable solution in the long run. The reason being, this essentially reproduces the gold standard. There's a reason we moved away from the gold standard, um, because it involves giving up an effective lender of last reserve and the inflation cushion, uh, and requires uh, occasional national bankruptcy. Some policy discussions seem to assume that it's possible by having a good enough fiscal policy never to default, even though you're issuing debt that's, uh, that is not uh, nominal. But, uh, but lending contracts can't, by their nature, do not condition on every possible eventuality. No matter what kind of a, of a debt contract you issue, there is some set of circumstances under which you might have to renegotiate. So there will, there will be occasional national bankruptcies if the EMU consist, uh, really insists that, uh, that there's no lender of last resort and the governments issue EM, uh, well, in any case, so long as the, as the union persists, there will be occasional national bankruptcy. <coughs> the other direction to go is to fix the institutional gaps. This will require fiscal coordination. Uh, it will require a bankruptcy and receivership mechanism, but I think that's not the uh, difficult part. The difficult part that does not seem to be getting as much discussion as it really has to, I think, is a risk-sharing mechanism. There has to be, if people are going to be, if countries are going to be giving up the inflation cushion, they need to see that there's something to replace it. Um, there, uh, there also, I think, has to be a true euro bond, that is, a bond that's seen as backed by the collective fiscal resources of the euro area, uh, and that could be used by the ECB for its monetary policy purposes. The, uh, I haven't gone into detail, but I think one of, a lot of the problem that we face, uh, that is faced today in the Euro area, 
uh, comes from the ECB trying to figure out how to run monetary policy uh, without having to make judgments about the fiscal soundness of individual governments. Uh, this, in order to have a true Eurobond like this, you have to have an institution that really did have fiscal power. It would be making decisions about which government's debt is uh, good enough to buy. Uh, it would have to be making, uh, it have to have a, at least a power, an emergency power to tax, for example, by uh, adding a surcharge <coughs> on, the, on the value add, added tax. Uh, and it would also need, uh, to do this right, you'd need fiscal stability regulation at the EMU <coughs> level, not at the national level, so that you could have an effective EMU uh, lender of last resort. Another problem with the EMU setup as it stands is that uh, stability regulation is largely at the national level and, and uh, financial institutions have spread across the whole of Europe. So is this politically impossible? The Eurobond issuing institution would imply fiscal transfers and it would need some kind of le democratic legitimacy. Setting up such an institution is a, is a huge task politically. And so far, there doesn't seem to be much movement in this direction amongst <laughs> European political leaders or their voting publics. Most of the movement is, is in the direction of uh, setting up a bankruptcy court, not uh, setting up fiscal cushions. But, uh, so you might say, well, this can't possibly happen. But then if you look at the current situation, if you look at the current state of the southern tier economies, the current state of the ECB balance sheet and of the European banking system balance sheet, you can see there are losses that have to be allocated somehow. There is a big political problem. Uh, there's no way <coughs> not that there is some way to proceed without making political decisions uh, and allocating losses across countries and voting publics. Uh, so I'll end with a question. Is it possible that the prospect of this allocation of losses coming about via a chaotic and destructive process might be enough to generate the needed political initiative? Fingers crossed.